Good morning, everybody. Denny here uh, with our uh, sermon for the week from Madison Baptist. I brought along a little uh, thing here, so you don't have to look at me, just the dark screen behind. <laughs> and this particular word is going to focus strongly in what we're saying uh, in, in our talk today. So let's look at it. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And let's see uh, how this is going to bear up and if it's going to be a uh, consonant of what we're talking about in First Peter. First of all, where are we in First Peter? Have you been enjoying it? I have. I really enjoy looking at this book. I'm doing Philippians studies on, on, uh, on Thursdays with the, part of the church Bible study. I'm doing this on, uh, you know, every every third Sunday and listening to the other sermons, by the way. If you listen to George's last week, it was terrific and, and Fortis's. So I'm really enjoying it. But where are we in First Peter right now? Okay, well, we just finished verse 16. Right with uh, with George last week. So, uh, what has Peter been talking about so far? He's been telling everybody about the great blessings and the guarantees they have in God. Going back to verse one, um, by the work of Christ, not their own work, and we don't have to count on ourselves. Uh, we have a new birth into a living hope. It says we're adopted as children into His family, the God's family. Right, fully drawn into His presence. Um, then he spoke about a great and solid hope we have, even though uh, we face hard times and difficulties. And, and ultimately, this gives us an inexpressible joy, is what that uh, section was about. Um, and then he reminds us, of course, this is not something that God just thought up on, on a whim, but that this has been talked about in Fortis's sermon from a few weeks ago. Um, that this has been talked about all through the scriptures and all through the history of, of, of time. Um, that the prophets have been testifying about the coming of the Messiah and bringing his salvation. So we have all this terrific stuff. That's what it's been telling us. Everything is in our favor. So what's the problem right? <laughs> if we have all that stuff? Because it talks about in, in verse um, 13 previously, um, sorry, verse 14, it says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Right? Just as someone who, uh, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, "Be holy, because I am holy." So we have some kind of problem going on. Right? People are not um, uh, following along with what this amazing gift that God has given them, but turning aside sometimes. Um, and why is it that we have this problem? Right? Why is there so many times in our lives? when we sort of stray away and become discontented with what we have? Um, is this because God has somehow changed? Well, obviously no, right? He's gonna stay the same. Uh, he's not changing like us. Is it because everything around us is so very bad and it sort of leads us into sin and corruption? Um, well, things may be bad, right? But if you're secure inside the king's palace, you have nothing to worry about, right? Um, isn't the problem that even though we are secure, like it says in the passage before, uh, we jump over the palace walls sometimes and we go sleep in a under a bridge somewhere like we did when we were orphans and right? before we were adopted by God. Um, we just go back into the world, you know, and it, it seems plain to me um, that our difficulties are going to come when we try and replace God's ways with our ways, right? Um, the, those things that we fled to God to get away from, we sometimes try and go back to, right? And uh, it seems to happen so easily. So, for, for example, like Jesus says, you know, if somebody slaps your face, turn the other cheek and let them slap that also. And don't retaliate, right? Because your pride is no longer your idol. Our response is often quite different, <laughs> unfortunately, right? And where does it lead to? When we, when we react in a way badly in those circumstances, it just leads to corruption. It leads to pain for us and sorrow and for everybody else too, right? And that's just one example of us turning to our own ways instead of to Christ's ways, right? So we, when we come to um, verse 13 in this chapter and beyond, uh, Peter's going to explain how to avoid, he's going to try to explain uh, how to avoid going from the beautiful to the corrupt, Right? from the fresh fruit to the rotten fruit. And in verse 13 to 16, he's going to say that um, we need to be obedient children to our father. Because why? 
father knows best, as the phrase goes, right? He says, don't conform to the evil desires like you did when you were ignorant of God's ways, right? And most importantly, he says, we should be holy because our father is holy, right? Holy, what does that mean? That means that God is completely true and honest, right? He loves with a true love that really stretches beyond our dreams, right? We can't even dream of the kind of love, the true and pure love and the good love that the father has, right? He's the opposite of corruption and the foulness, right? It's all clean with him, there's no shadow. And that's what he's calling us to do. <laughs> he's calling us to be that. He's calling us to all the best things in life to a true and a free relationship, right? To a perspective on life that's gonna produce beautiful fruit, even if it's planted in mud and has manure in it, right? That's our mandate. That's what we, he, that, what, what our best is with God, is to be holy. Now, how many of us feel like we're holy? <laughs> it's a hard thing, it seems, right? To, to be holy, it's a very hard thing. It's not in our nature. Right? And what Peter's going to do now in verses 17 to 21, is he's going to try and tell us how to be holy. Okay, so let's look at uh, that passage right now. I'll read it really quick for you. Um, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so that your faith and hope are in God. Okay. That's quite a passage. There's a, there's a hundred sermons, <laughs> so I can't cover every little detail. Um, but one of the first things that might have stopped you right off is as soon as you read verse 17, um, maybe you got hung up on the following words, judge works impartially and fear, right? Some things we, uh, we have a hard time with, right? So you hear that and it's like, what judgment? God judging my works? impartially you know and i should live in fear and it's like wait a second um i'm not I, i'm not sure how i feel about that. right now why if we've been called to such a solid hope leading up to this point does this make an appearance right this thing now before we get to that i want to say it's interesting that we immediately get worried and our heart starts racing when we hear about this idea of judgment right it kind of tells us right off that we got something to hide that we're afraid of judgment because we know you've done something wrong, right? Um, years and years ago, I was living in a duplex and I, I looked out my window one day and I saw down at the bottom of the basement apartment, I saw a bunch of police officers rushing in at night and they busted down the door and they grabbed this guy who was a drug dealer that people knew in the neighborhood as a drug dealer and they took him away to the police car and they just drove off. And you know, I saw it and it was quite shocking, but at no point did I think, oh, what if that could happen to me? Because I'm not a drug dealer, right? It never occurred to me for a second that that could be me and that I should be afraid or worried about these things because that's not something I was doing, right? Um, so <laughs> um, I had nothing to fear in that case. But when you connect the words, God, judge, fear, I start sweating a little, right? Because I know I'm guilty. The question is, should I be sweating over this passage? Right? Should I be afraid that because this verse says, um, or it, it seems to say, be afraid because God will cast a sinning Christian out. You know, be very afraid because God is judging you. Um, no, I shouldn't be sweating. And I'll tell you why. Um, if that were true, if this verse was about God saying, watch out because of your sin, you know, live in, in dreadful fear because something terrible is going to happen to you. I'm going to, I'm going to forget you or cast you out. It would literally contradict every single verse in first Peter, right? Including the very next one, which says you were redeemed. You were redeemed in verse 18 or in verse 23, you have been born again 
or in verse three, he has given us new birth into a living hope. So that can't be what this verse is talking about, but it still seems odd, right? So if that's not what's going on, uh, what does verse 17 mean? Because verse 17 is kind of the hinge that the rest of this uh, passage turns on. So it's very important to understand it as best we can, right? Um, is it a warning that you're gonna be punished for your sin in some way, or God is gonna take away your reward or something like that, right? I mean, look at the passage. It's, it just seems odd, this idea. Since you call a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners in reverent fear. Okay, as foreigners on earth, obviously. Um, so uh, how are we gonna handle this verse, which, which seems difficult to understand? Well, the key is whenever you face something like this, when you're studying the Bible, you hit a verse and you're like, I'm not sure where this is going. And I'm not sure how this fits in with everything else. And that's the key is how does it fit in? Right? How does it fit in with what we're, we're gonna be talking about? And the important thing to remember always, 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 always is context, right? We're gonna look at not a single verse. That's where things are gonna go wrong. If you're interpreting the Bible or someone asking you a question, why does this verse say this? And you're like, oh my goodness, I don't understand that verse. Just slow down, right? Slow down and look at what the rest of things are being said around it. I mean, I'm not even talking about going back into the whole Bible and trying to pull it all together. That's great. But let's just look at the, the context, right? So imagine if, if someone told you um, a story about a person who was asked to take an oath, right? And you think to yourself, asked to take an oath, what's going on? Are they... Are they on the stand at their murder trial and they have to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth? Well, if the rest of the story was that there was a pastor who was asking this, for this oath and the person who was asking it to was a woman in a long white dress with a tiara on, right? you'd say, oh, wait a minute. This isn't a trial about murder. It's a wedding. Right? And that's what context does for you. And that's what looking up the whole passage is going to tell us about this very verse. Okay, because Peter's going to make a really great point here, and I want to get to it. Um, so does this passage, when you read it, look it over again yourself for a minute. Does it sound like this whole passage is some kind of threat? Right? Not at all when you read it. You know, there's, there's some places like in, in, in 1 Corinthians where things are so out of control in the church that Paul tells them God is going to act to bring them back to obedience. Right? But this passage is not threatening, right, in any way. It is, however, an appeal when you look at it. Peter is appealing to you. He's trying to get something from you, right? He's saying, listen, I'll tell you why, okay? So what is this thing in, in verse 17? If Peter's gonna make an appeal to us to encourage us to not conform to evil desires, right? What is this verse about, right? Look at what it says in the details. Since you call on a father is what it starts with, right? So what is Peter doing? He's saying, look back for a second at verse 14, where he calls you obedient children, right? So Peter knows right off who is his audience, and we are his audience, by the way, and his audience at the time. He knows we look on God as a father that we love, right? Therefore, as obedient children, right? So right away, you know that the, the, the listener and yourself, what you want as a Christian is that relationship with the father. So Peter's saying here, um, since you call on a father, so it's not a question if you are not saved or hanging by a thread, you recognize who your father is. And what Peter is gonna do here is gonna say, this is what your father is like, okay? And it's to encourage you to aim at something better than sin. What does sin do? Sin discourages, okay? It might seem cool in the short term, it always leads to discouragement. I don't think I'm making that up. But the whole book here, whole book of First Peter is about encouragement, right? It's about getting to that joy inexpressible, having that now joy inexpressible. So um, what is this about impartial judgment of works? What does that mean? Right? Now, impartial means really in, 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 in the Greek in particular, it's used as looking beyond the mask, right? Which is a weird phrase. <laughs> right? It means that God doesn't see the externals. He sees the internals, right? So it means God judges works, our works, 
um, and of all people, not by outward appearance or anything else, but by a person's heart, right? So God impartially looks at our works. He looks past all of our pretense and he looks at our true thing and he sees our works where sometimes we go astray, right? Not always, but sometimes we do. So God is looking into us impartially, he looks beyond all of our pretense and everything else and at what we're really like. Now we look at the father and we say, God sees us like that. He truly sees my heart. Right? And what does it mean to us when our father who we love, we want to be obedient children, sees our sin, right? What does it mean to us? It makes you want to repent, right? It makes you want to repent and to live as a foreigner in the world, okay? Reject the world. We're, we're, it's, it's saying the world is, has its own rules and its own system. You don't belong to that, right? You know you don't belong to that. So he says, reject that. Live as a foreigner in the world and to be in reverent fear, right? So what is this reverent fear? Is fear, we talked about this before. What is the fear of God, right? It's, it's not a fear like terror. Oh my goodness, he's gonna get me something awful like that, right? It's not meant to be that way for the Christian. But what it is, is an amazement and a respect of what God is like, right? That he's powerful, but he's wise and he's good and he judges and sees everything. He judges fairly and truly, right? And when we think of how good God is and how awesome he is, that's our fear of God, right? We think of God and say, he is so great, not just big and frightening at all, but that he is tremendous. Look at what he does for us. Look at what he's like. He's so surprising all the time, you know, not what we expect. And we have that, it says in several places in the Bible, the fear of God causes you to tremble, not from fear, but from amazement, right? And from joy. We look at God and we say the fear of God is a beautiful thing. It's something that's given to us for us to enjoy and to cherish, not to be afraid of, right? So God is looking at our inside person and we know that. We see how he judges, how he looks past our pretenses. And we say, we don't want things to be like that, right? We want to have a reverent fear of the Lord, to look at him and say, I'm sorry, Lord, when I do these things. You know, I know that that's not what I should be doing. And I'm going to live differently because of what you're like. Okay. So now let's read on those, the, the next little section here. We'll stick it together. So now um, it says, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in those last times for your sake. Okay, so here is the appeal that Peter's gonna make, okay? The appeal is to be holy, right? And what is he hinging it on? He says the thing about the father, the impartial judgment, and he says in verse 18, for you know, okay? So since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, who sees everything, right? Live out your time as foreigners here in Revenue Fear, for you know the following. So it's because of the knowledge you have that you're gonna want to have this reverend fear and live holy, right? And what is this knowledge? For you know. Remember what God through Christ did for you while you were a sinner, right? He redeemed you with his own life. He bought you out of slavery to sin from an empty and futile way of life that we inherited from our fathers and they inherited from their fathers and they inherited from all the way going back to Adam, okay? A life of, as it says later on, of hating and being hated, of desperately desiring the perishable world as an idle, at the same time hating it for never satisfying you, right? And going on an endless cycle of unhappiness. That's the world. That's the, the fruit of sin, which leads to death, right? So what do we have? We have this idea that for you know, what has God done for you? He's pulled you out of this mess, 
right, of your own making. Okay, he redeems you while you're a sinner. And then what does he say? He doesn't buy you with things like gold and silver, which we cherish, right? And we want as our inheritance, <laughs> as much gold and silver as we can lay our hands on, uh, which you can't take with you, right? And he's going to buy you with something so much better, right? What does he buy our freedom with? He buys something at his own cost, right? And the cost is the most precious thing God has, his relationship with his son, right? And he's called here a lamb without blemish. That's what we're paid for with, right? We're not paid with gold and silver, which anybody can raise and lose or whatever, but it's the actual lamb of God that is in our place. That is, that is the payment for our sin, right? So in, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament, right, you have this idea that God tells the people that every year they should make a sacrifice, Right? And that the, the blood of the animal being sacrificed was a symbol to them of, the, of their sin and that a death sentence was on anyone who sins and it must be paid for. Right? So do you bring just any lamb and, or, or any, any kind of sacrifice? No. You're supposed to bring the best thing you have. Right? The most precious lamb, the most perfect lamb you have. Right? And this in itself is obviously a foreshadowing of Christ. Right? He said, bring the best, because God, when he puts the sacrifice, the final sacrifice in place, it'll be his best, right? So to save us, right, and pay for our sins, Christ willingly goes to the cross. And what's Christ like? He's sinless, he's perfect, he's beautiful. In other words, he's holy, right? Remember the Passover? Right? You have the lamb's blood smeared on the doors and that saves our lives, that too was a foreshadowing of what God was going to do from us, for us, right? So you have all these instances in, in, in the Old Testament as you go through, you keep running into these things, these foreshadowings of your sins being paid for, not by you. You're incapable of paying for your sins, right? But God himself and his graciousness pays for them in so many different instances. Just read the Old Testament. It's rife with it, okay? You keep running into it. And, and you remember what Fortis said a few weeks ago, he talked about how the prophets have been, have been writing about this for so long. It's not an accident. The whole thing has been planned and it says so in verse 20, right? God planned it, right? To save us for a relationship with him before the foundation of the world. That's when this was planned, right? That Christ knew. And it was brought to fruition. When you think about it, if you're reading that, that epistle for the first time, first Peter, it was only a few years ago that Christ was crucified, right? All of history coming to this moment, and it just happened. And that's why he says, this was for you, this happened at the right time, right? So God knew that the gift of life for people and a relationship with people would require a savior because of our frailty. And that's before the first sin ever occurred. Right? God had this plan. That should fill us with hope. You know, there's not an accident and a series of things that God is reacting to. You know, he's not dependent on us for things to work. He works it. Right? And again, that's for us an encouragement because we're not saying it's all up to me. I have to solve it. Not at all. God is solving it for you. Right? And he's bringing you along. Now look at the contrast here. Right? He contrasts two things. He says, the, the futile, perishable inheritance of our ancestors, right? Replaced by a glorious inheritance provided by a God who loves us to take our punishment on himself and then to adopt us into his family as children, right? You're a sinner. God gives his best to save you because you can't save yourself, but he loves you, right? And then on top of that, he doesn't just say, now go your way. He adopts you into his family, right? The family of the Trinity. You don't become a member of the Trinity. That's heresy. <laughs> but God is bringing you to himself, right? The thing that binds the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is love, right? And they bring us into that. Now, verse 21 says, that's why we believe in God, right? Not just that he died on the cross, but that he was also raised on the third day, right? And glorified by who? By the same Father 
who is going to raise us when we die, right? So our hope and our faith are in God. And that's what that verse in verse, uh, let me read that verse 21 just very quickly here, or verse 20 and 21. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, that's Christ, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your hope, sorry, so that your faith and hope are in God, right? Your faith and hope are not in things in the world. And that's what Peter is saying. Why are you looking back? And why do you want to look back? There's nothing there for you, right? Your, your faith and your hope are not in a career, right? Um, it's not in checking off things on your bucket list that makes your life trivial and meaningless and selfish, right? It's the resurrection itself, not just the death of Christ, but the death and resurrection of Christ. What does that do, right? It gives us confidence, not only that we will continue to live with God, but that all of our lives and all of our works are not futile, right? He redeems our life here that we live in joy. And it says a joy inexpressible because of all these good things that he's done, because of the confidence that we have, right? All of that is what impels us towards God. So finally, how do we get holy, right? <laughs> well, we're looking at it. As adopted children, we get holy by remembering, right? Like it says, for, in, in verse 18, for you know, and what do you know? God put us, he pulled us out of all that and saved us in such a glorious and a beautiful way, right? So we remember that we're adopted children. We remember this relationship that God wants to have with us, right? He puts his spirit in our heart that tells us all the time, remember these things, cultivate these things, grow these things in your heart. You're going to produce fruit a hundredfold. All the time telling us good things, good things, good things. And we cooperate with the spirit, right? And what does the spirit tell us? He doesn't tell us drudgery. Go and do this boring thing. Go and do this drudgery. Go and do all this work. Nothing. What does he say? Remember the best things you have, right? And what are the best things we have? The great blessings of a loving God, right? He gave his best so that we could have the best, right? Which we didn't deserve in any way whatsoever. So our holiness is not something we produce. It's our holiness of saying we have all this stuff. What is the world going to offer? What is this stupid sin I'm going to do right now going to offer me? You know, that I always rush to. But it's like, no, I don't have to. You're, you're not going to stop sinning. <laughs> Peter's not saying that. But he's saying, turn away from it. Don't look at it as something you want to do. And when you do it, repent. God judges your works impartially. He looks, he sees it all, right? He knows this is good, this is not good. And we look at that and say, this is the God who redeemed me. Should I be doing this to this God? No, I want to be like him. I want to be holy. Right? Because holiness is all the good and the best things in life. So let me, let me close this thing off by reading a quote. I might have read this before because I really love this quote. Um, if I have, bear with me. It's from a guy named Samuel Rutherford. He's a Puritan author from about 300 years ago. And he, well, more than that. But he writes this. Oh, what love. Christ would not entrust our redemption to angels, to millions of angels but he would come himself and suffer in person. He would not give a low and base price for us clay. He would buy us with a great ransom so that he might overbuy us and none could overbid him in his market for souls. If there had been a million more believers, and I'm sorry, if there had been millions of more believers and many heavens, without any new bargain, his blood should have bought them all. And all these and many heavens should have smelled one rose of life. Christ should have been one and the same tree of life to all of them. Oh, we underbid and undervalue that prince of love who did overvalue us. We will not sell all we have to buy him, but he sold all he had and himself too to buy us. That's our hope. 
we have a hope in a God who overbuys us, who gave too much to save us. And that's our uh, encouragement to be holy. We look at this God, we reject what the world offers because it offers nothing in comparison. Anyway, thanks a lot. Uh, continue reading ahead in, 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 in First Peter. God bless you. It's a wonderful book. Have a great Lord's Day. See you soon, I hope.